Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Ian Stevens, and I'm uh, chairing this session. And uh, I'm from the uh, Marta Hospital in uh, Brisbane. And I'll put a little plug in for the uh, Marta. It's the biggest, in terms of deliveries, uh, obstetric unit in Australia or New Zealand at the moment. I think a lot of people don't know that. I've been uh, uh, both uh, informed and entertained by this meeting, or at this meeting. I've uh, learnt, for example, that there are only three professions. I've understood the uh, six characteristics that make up a profession. And um, uh, so uh, things that I hadn't thought of before delivered very well. A few things before we start. Uh, make sure that your mobile phones are switched off or on silent mode. Uh, you can uh, download the Congress app uh, from the App Store still, and uh, you have to search for ASA NSC. You log in as your email address, and the password is uh, ASA2014. And um, so we have uh, three speakers this morning in the uh, subspecialty of uh, obstetric anaesthesia. I must confess that I voted uh, in the debate uh, for the uh, proposition that it was just a state of mind but that was because I was entertained by the people framing the debate, and I don't really believe it. I believe we are really uh, a subspecialty. And I'm going to introduce the uh, three speakers just from where they come from, and you understand from that that there's geographical uh, diversity in here, and you can assume, because I've read CVs, that these people are eminent, and uh, I think they'll have a lot of good things to say. So the uh, first uh, speaker is uh, James Griffiths. He's from... Um, the Royal Women's Hospital and the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne, and he's going to talk about neurological dilemmas and obstetric anaesthesia between a rock and a hard place. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for sticking around for the last day of the conference. My background is essentially as a tertiary hospital obstetric anaesthetist who dabbles in neurosurgery although some days I feel like a neurosurgical anaesthetist who dabbles in obstetrics, I think it depends on the day. Naturally, I'm interested in the cases where the two specialties overlap, which is relatively infrequent. Uh, my task today is to go over the ways in which neurological disease can impact on pregnancy and the ways in which pregnancy can impact on neurological disease. Now, neurological disease still kills women today conditions such as thrombosis, hemorrhage and epileptic seizures still rate third, second or third or fourth on the maternal mortality reports every single year. And in fact, the incidence hasn't changed much over the last few decades, despite the changing around them of other conditions such as cardiac disease, uh, eclampsia and hemorrhage. Most pregnant women with serious diseases such as neurovascular disease and tumours are treated in tertiary hospital settings. So today I'd like to focus more on the conditions that we're much more likely to come across in the lay board setting and present challenges to our day-to-day -day practice. The conditions, there's obviously endless numbers of conditions we could cover, but today I'd like to look at uh, hydrocephalus and shunts, uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, MS, a spina bifida, and particularly women who have undergone previous spinal surgery uh, and neurostimulation. There's a number of different types of uh, spinal surgery, uh, ranging from fusion procedures, decompression type procedures such as laminectomy and uh, microdiscectomy and uh, shunts and infusion pumps. I asked a random sample of colleagues before I came how they would approach a patient with a neurological disease that they came across on lay board. And the answer was very much the same and it reminded me a lot of a sign that you see around Melbourne and I'm hoping it's not just a Melbourne thing. Dial before you dig. The attitude was very much any patient with any neurological disease should be assessed by a neurologist or a neurosurgeon prior to us going anywhere near them. And I, I think you'll see that there are certainly some cases where that's true, but it's not universal. Starting with hydrocephalus, I think it makes sense to work from the top and then work our way south. So hydrocephalus is a condition where there's uh, an abnormal accumulation of CSF within the ventricles. There are two types of hydrocephalus, either communicating or non-communicating. Uh, non-communicating hydrocephalus is what we usually mean uh, and it relates to obstruction of CSF drainage from the ventricles 
and that can be from a myriad of causes, either infection, hemorrhage, tumour, or uh, congenital causes. The obstructed ventricles act like an intracranial mass, and you'll, I'm sure, remember the munro kelly doctrine. Any intracranial mass increases the uh, intracranial contents to a certain uh, extent, and then at that point, raised intracranial pressure occurs, and you get uh, tonsillar herniation. The mainstay of treatment of hydrocephalus is obviously insertion of a shunt. A shunt is a device with three sections, an intraventricular drain, a valve type mechanism of which there are many sorts, and an outflow tract draining CSF into another body cavity, which is most commonly the peritoneal cavity, although the pleura and the right atrium are sometimes used. Now, pregnant women often run into problems with their uh, shunt. Pregnant women with a functioning VP shunt often run into problems. And this is because the distal end of the drainage system is suddenly sharing the intra-abdominal contents with a gravid uterus. Studies show that up to 75% of patients with a VP shunt will have increasing pain, uh, both abdominal pain and headache, and about half will ex experience exacerbations of raised intracranial pressure. In one study, 23% of patients actually required uh, revision surgery to re revise the distal end of the shunt. A proportion of patients who have been managed conservatively with, with hydrocephalus will actually need a shunt to be inserted during their pregnancy. Now, patients with raised intracranial pressure are obviously uh, contraindicated to have regional anesthesia or to, certainly to have dural puncture. However, patients with a functioning VP shunt uh, can safely have regional anesthesia. Uh, and vaginal delivery is not actually contraindicated, although the valsalva associated with the second stage of labour involves very substantial increases in intracranial pressure. So patients who have pre-existing raised intracranial pressure are at risk and operative delivery will most commonly be used, or a highly functioning epidural and an instrumental second stage would be an option. This is one of the times where the anesthesia is bad for my blood pressure because an epidural and a well-functioning epidural is brilliant, but a dural puncture is really bad. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension is a condition that's gone by a variety of names over the years and has been essentially a diagnosis of exclusion in patients presenting with uh, symptoms of raised intracranial pressure. It's an obstetric population I've described it as. It's common, commonly occurs in young, uh, young women, uh, particularly obese women. And these uh, women present with headache and papilledema and uh, normal CSF and normal imaging, although they do have the slip-like ventricles you can see on the screen. Uh, there's a number of medical options which include uh, diuretics like acetazolamide, intermittent lumbar drainage of CSF and weight loss strategies. And in fact, there's a study to show that lap band surgery is effective in treating idiopathic intracranial hypertension. If these treatments fail, then the option involved is to put in a lumboperitoneal drain, a permanent shunt. And in these patients, regional anesthesia is safe and effective, including uh, intrathecal anesthesia. But if, a sh if there's a shunt present, then that becomes contraindicated. Firstly, because any injection of local anesthetic into this CSF in the lumbar region, an unpredictable amount of the drug will go down the shunt. And secondly, because the shunt is in directly in the path of the needle and there's risks of damaging the shunt with either an epidural or with a spinal needle. There are case reports of people doing it successfully and uh, as there are case reports of people doing many things successfully, I think this is one particularly that Sir Humphrey Appleby would describe as courageous. Most of the, the idiopathic intracranial hypertension women do well and symptoms improve after pregnancy. Moving on to multiple sclerosis, as you know, it's an autoimmune, uh, it's an immune-mediated disease anyway that uh, has a initially relapsing remitting course with discrete episodes of uh, neurological dysfunction where these clinical symptoms depend on the location of the lesions and these change from episode to episode. It's more common in women than men again, and it's more common in women to present in women in reproduct of reproductive age. There's a whole host of etiological work looking at causes of the disease and many theories. Uh, 
there's some evidence, in fact, that the disease is increasing in frequency around the world. The aims of treatment of MS involve accelerating the resolution of each episode, preventing recurrent episodes, and reducing the steady decline of the disease over time. And like many autoimmune diseases, MS tends to get better in pregnancy, especially in the third trimester. However, the, the fact that the women have a pregnancy doesn't affect the progression of the disease. So over a period of time, the number of relapses they will have over that time is unchanged. They just won't have them while they're pregnant. They'll have them in the three months after the pregnancy. And that may be due to uh, fatigue, uh, intercurrent infection, or removal of the immunotolerant state that pregnancy is. Now, there's been concern in the past about the use of regional anaesthesia in MS for a number of reasons, partly because spinal anaesthesia particularly involves putting concentrated local anaesthetic into the CSF, and if there are denervated spinal nerves in the region, there's potential to cause neurotoxicity. There's also potential to exacerbate relapses of MS. Now, uh, there's been really very little high quality evidence to support these contentions. And in, while initially when there was a move from spinal anesthesia to epidural anesthesia, th thinking that that would involve less, uh, lower concentrations of local anesthetic reaching the spinal nerves, essentially now there's not much evidence for that either. And most obstetric anesthetists would be happy to perform regional anesthesia in the setting of MS. A Couple of things to bear in mind in severe MS, uh, patients who have disease of the thoracic spinal cord are at risk of autonomic dysfunction and can have very profound hypotension which is resistant to treatment associated with regional, both regional and general anesthesia really. The other thing is that hyperthermia is associated with uh, MS relapse. So this is it's unlikely under regional anesthesia but under general anesthesia it's important to avoid uh, overwarming and temperature should be monitor monitored. Talk briefly about spina bifida, although it's a disease we're seeing less commonly these days. As you know, it's one of a spectrum of congenital disorders relating to failure of closure of the neural tube, and the subtypes describe the anatomical extent of the abnormality, and that ranges from very minor, where there's essentially no skin defect at all, through to uh, very severe and incompatible with life, where you get the entire neural tube exposed. The incidence is falling due to maternal folate supplementation and better antenatal diagnosis. The current incidence is something like one in a thousand. Uh, although the incidence in sufferer, the offspring of sufferers is much, much higher, maybe three or four percent. Now survivors of spina bifida who reach reproductive age have a host of problems, including kyphoscoliosis, abnormal pelvic shape, and neuropathic bladder and may have undergone multiple corrective procedures in the past to uh, correct musculoskeletal and uh, uh, urological abnormalities. So recurrent UTIs and latex allergy are common, although becoming less so. Whilst normal vaginal delivery is possible in a patient with an abnormal pelvic shape and uh, lower limb weakness, it's very likely that instrumental delivery or operative delivery will be required. And this raises the problem of regional anesthesia in these patients who have uh, very abnormal and to, to some extent unpredictable from the outside uh, anatomy. The procedure can be very technically difficult due to the kyphoscoliosis and abnormal pelvic shape of the patient and also due to scarring from the corrective surgery. And secondary local anesthetic spread is unpredictable due to the uncertain CSF circulation. And this can lead to a variety of problems when attempting regional anesthesia, uh, such as inadequate caudal spread of local anesthetic due to the anatomical abnormality, or excessive uh, kephalad spread, uh, unilateral blocks, subdural block, etc. Thirdly, and I think the most significant risk, is that more than half of patients with spina bifida can have tethering of the spinal cord due to a, a shortened phylum terminale, and that means the spinal cord can finish anywhere really, but certainly below L12. Um, I'm not sure how many of you, were, of you were at Dr. Burgod's talk on Sunday morning, but the cystic lesions that you get when you inject into the spinal cord certainly filled me with fear. So I think spina bifida is a condition where many people would think of it as an absolute contraindication, but certainly is a case where 
clear understanding of the anatomy of the particular patient is necessary uh, by imaging or discussion with uh, our neurosurgical or neurological college colleagues. Yeah. Moving on to previous spinal surgery, there's a, there's a, this is actually an area where there's some quite good data and some quite good review articles, such as this one by the Cowton in the Belgian group. Women who have undergone back surgery in the past have often, often sort of forgotten about it. They think of having a back operation, same as having their appendix out. And when they come to have an epidural in labour, they think of that as a, their right to have an epidural, same as everybody else gets an epidural. Uh, I think it's important that we have an idea of what the success rate is likely to be so we can inform them of uh, what we can offer. And sometimes we can offer things that are quite good and sometimes we can't. Giving some thought to what you need to successfully achieve regional anaesthesia in any patient, you need to be able to position them and reverse the lumbar lordosis to achieve uh, getting the needle in the right place. And then you need a CSF circulation and an epidural space that are patent and free from scarring. And to any extent, the loss of those things reduces the success rate. Now, there are three types of failure discussed in the literature. Technical failure, which, as I mentioned, is inability to actually locate the epidural or intrathecal space. Functional failure, where you get in the right space, but the block just doesn't work. It needs repeated top-ups, is patchy or inadequate, or doesn't work at all. And then complications, such as sub subdural block or high spinal nerve trauma and postural puncture headache. Interestingly, the rates of dural puncture are quite high, but the rates of postural puncture headache seem to be lower and their supposition is that if there's a large amount of scarring, that reduces the CSF leak. In terms of spinal fusion, there are many different approaches and there are many different degrees. It's logical to think that a small operation equals small amount of scarring and small amount of reduced mobility, large operation, the opposite. So these uh, x-rays show an anterior approach, a posterior approach, and the more extensive Harrington rod type procedure. That there is an evolution really in spinal surgery in terms of the approaches. This is the traditional open operation, which is often much more extensive than this. This is the incision from a lateral or anterior approach. And one of the surgeons I work with is now doing minimally invasive spinal surgery where the entire operation essentially is done through these tubular retractors and under endless x-ray guidance. This seems to take longer, doesn't seem to reduce the amount of pain they get in the early phase, but certainly improves their recovery. And importantly for us, I think, doesn't involve any incision at all in the midline, doesn't involve any dissection of the epidural space. So I think these patients, while they'll still have reduced mobility, may have a better, op uh, better potential for regional anaesthesia in the future. In terms of how much evidence there is, there are many case series published there are very few actually controlled. Lots of centres have looked over five years of data and have presented their findings, but there are very few actual controlled studies. The studies seem to suggest a success rate of between 60 and 80% for an epidural in a patient who's had a spinal fusion, and probably a bit better than that in patients who have had more minor procedures like a laminectomy or a discectomy. The, uh, Again, the more major the procedure, the more likely patients are to need repeated top-ups and to have inadequate or partial failure of the technique. This is a very interesting case report, which is unfortunately is in German. I, um, the English abstract is not terribly helpful, but one bottom bottle of Australian red wine to a colleague of mine organised a translation. It uh, is actually very interesting. It's a patient with Frederick's ataxia who has extensive spinal surgery and needed a caesarean section. And they discuss in this patient there are very good reasons not to do a general or an epidural or a spinal anaesthetic. And the pros and cons of each really um, summarise the dilemmas that you see in um, the interaction between neurological disease and obstetric anaesthesia. In this patient, they actually did an epidural and it worked fine. One of the areas I work in a lot is uh, spinal cord stimulation or neuromodulation in general. Uh, this is a very rapidly expanding field as the proceduralists find more and more indications for it. Uh, stimulators can be used intracranially for conditions like Parkinson's disease, peripherally for diseases like uh, trigeminal neuralgia, occipital neuralgia, 
but the spinal cord indications at the moment are complex regional pain syndrome and failed back surgery syndrome, and they seem to be very effective. The systems involve placing an electrode by a variety of means into the epidural space at a location determined by the neurosurgeon and neurologist. There are leads connecting from the electrodes to a pulse generator, which is placed either in the buttock or in the anterior abdominal wall. The batteries in the pulse generator are charged either by wearing a proximity plate, which generates an electromagnetic field in close proximity to the battery, and patients tend to wear that for an hour a week just while they're watching TV, or the battery gets changed every three to five years under general anaesthetic. So most young patients have a proximity charging device, and this creates a lot of the issues in pregnancy. In fact, one of the reasons why I find this fascinating in pregnancy is that the amount that we just don't know. Apart from a few, a few individual case reports, there's really very little written. The, if you ask the product reps to send you the information they have about pregnancy and spinal cord stimulation, there are two papers they send you. One is a literature review, which summarises all the individual case reports. And one is a case series on spinal cord stimulation and specific patient-specific considerations. I think this must set some sort of record for the world's shortest case series, because it describes the outcomes of exactly two patients who underwent spinal cord stimulation. And in fact, one of those patients turned off their stimulator when they thought about getting pregnant and turned it back on again when they, after they'd delivered. So there's really only one patient in this paper that had spinal cord stimulation during the pregnancy. Now, the evidence that is quoted in these papers discussing the safety of spinal cord stimulators, particularly rela relating to electromagnetic fields and the use of uh, electromagnetism around pregnancy, they quote papers like uh, 1960s research looking at ECT in pregnant women, uh, papers looking at cardioversion in uh, pregnant women with arrhythmias, and one paper actually quoted a, a study looking at the outcomes of pregnant cows living in close proximity to high voltage power lines. <laughs> Not surprisingly, in the light of this quality of evidence, neither the TGA or the FDA have approved the use of spinal cord stimulators during pregnancy. So the recommendation of the company is that they're turned off. However, even turning them off creates issues because this, the companies don't know what happens when the batteries are turned off for nine months when they're not designed to be turned off. Uh, some of them didn't have s solid state memory and therefore lose all their settings. And like mobile phone batteries, they're not designed, they're designed to be charged and discharged, although the technology is constantly improving. Now, most women turn off their device as soon as they become pregnant. Sorry, as soon as they know they're pregnant. Now, obviously, if neuromodulation or if the electromagnetic field associated with charging actually causes significant effects to the developing fetus, turning it off at eight weeks is way too late. The trouble is we don't really know how this whole area of medicine affects fertility. We don't know how chronic pain affects fertility. We don't know how the potent analgesics that the women are taking in the, as the alternative to spinal cord stimulation may, be, may well be worse than having a functional spinal cord stimulator. And we obviously don't know about the neuromodulation itself. Every single paper written on this subject observes that patients with spinal cord stimulators are much happier, have their pain much more controlled, have much more energy, and therefore are much more likely to get pregnant in the first place. From an obstetric and aesthetic point of view, we need to know exactly where the device is and exactly where it's tunneled from. Some of these devices are placed via L2 or L3 or L1, L2 and then are tunneled up very long distances in the epidural space to lie in the lower uh, epidural space of the lower thoracic region. We also need to know where the leads run because they can run for very significant distances. The leads are 50 centimetres long. And where the pulse generator is. Pulse generators are less commonly put in the lower abdominal wall now in childbearing women, but certainly have been in the past, which creates an issue for cesarean section. Now, I was going to talk about spinal ultrasound. I think that's a huge topic that we might leave for another day. So just to conclude, uh, there's a large number of neurological conditions. I think we've covered some of the key ones that we're likely to come across in everyday practice. Uh, previous spinal surgery was shown as associated with a very high failure rate. And uh, communication with many of those conditions, communication with our neurological and neurosurgical colleagues is very important. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for that, and uh, I've thought of a few questions that may come up. Uh, 
uh, when we get a chance. And we'll have questions at the end of the session. Um, so I'll invite now uh, Dr. Victoria Ellie to come and uh, uh, talk on oxytocin's older new drugs revisited. She's from the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital in uh, Brisbane. Thanks for that. Thanks very much, Ian, and thanks for having me today. So I was hoping that this might get you a bit more interested in the topic. Uh, this morning I'm going to talk about the history and current use of oxytocic agents. I'm going to talk a little bit about their background and the evidence supporting their use today, both in vaginal delivery and caesarean section. So if you're not feeling that interested, I've just got my last slide here. Uh, the take-home messages. So all three classes of oxytocic agents have a role. Our practice concerning oxytocin in caesarean section is evolving, and really the ideal agent is going to depend a lot on the patient characteristics and the practice setting. We know that these agents are used both for prevention and for treatment of postpartum hemorrhage. And as a profession, we're invo involved in both of these. As a profession, we've seen a lot of diagrams like this, but the great news is the only important bit's just here. So the agents that we're going to talk about today are ergometrin and friends, oxytocin and friends, and the prostaglandin family. And they probably all increase intracellular calcium and cause myosin phosphorylation. And of course, it's all about reducing hemorrhage. And we know that that's important. And in Australia, it was a fourth, fourth leading cause of death in the triennium 2003 to 2005. So before I go through the agents, I have a case to share from 1863 in the Melbourne Lying In Hospital. And it's taken from a book by Janet McCalman. And I'm using this to just show how much we've gained in this department. And we learn from history how well people have done and how lucky we are now. And to get you into the spirit of the 1860s, this, hen this is a painting by Henry Byrne of Swanston Street from the bridge. And it was painted in 1861, just two years before this patient presented. So Mrs. Aris was an Irish lady, 44 years old and in her 12th pregnancy. It's likely that many of those previous children didn't survive. She presented in labour with good-sized twins and had a long labour. So just from knowing these facts, it makes us a bit worried about her risk of postpartum haemorrhage. And I'll come back to her later. So in early Australia, maternal mortality was very high. In fact, across the board, mortality was really high. And this diagram shows five to 600 deaths per 100,000. And this remained really high until 1937. And these figures are really replicated in the United Kingdom. About 1937, you can see a rapid and constant decline right up until now. And the most recent uh, numbers we have for Australia is 8.4 per 100,000. Now, the factors contributing to this rapid decline are multiple and really interesting to look at. And probably a main contributor is the introduction of antibiotics in the 1930s. Now, this timeline is really specific to factors involved in the management of postpartum hemorrhage that would have affected that decline. So here's the reduction in mortality just starting. Uh, just before that fall, ergometrin was isolated. Uh, the following oxytocic agent was oxytocin, and after that, the prostaglandins. But of course, there's many things happening at this time. So in 1929, it's the, the first transfusion service in Australia was developed and continued to improve over that century. Uh, and in 1940, just after the decline, uh, Davis in Chicago suggested using ergometrin prophylactically, which was quite novel, uh, and that was the first description of active management. But of course, there are other things affecting the reduction in mortality. These are things, very basic th things like nutrition, antenatal care, reduction in fertility rates, the increasing use of contraception, and the increasing safe use of caesarean section. So now we'll have a look at the three agents. And of course, I couldn't do this talk without a picture of the rye, the rye with the fungus. And this is the fungus Claviceps purpurea, 
and that's the fungus that grows on the rye when the rye gets damp. And when you eat the bread made from the rye, you get ergotism. And there were outbreaks of ergotism, uh, particularly in southern France where this rye was grown. And during the outbreaks, there was noted to be an increase in stillbirths, and that was due to the oxytocic effect. And also, um, the symptoms included peripheral gangrene, and that was due to its vasospastic effects. And it was known as an excellent uterotonic that caused an almost incessant action on the uterus. And it's documented to have been used uh, in the 1500s. And the dose at that time apparently is reported to have been three of those little black spurs. And apparently that's about 500 micrograms of ergometrin or the equivalent. Then in the 1800s, there was very overzealous use of the of ergometrin or the, of the uh, uterotonic and it led to lots of uterine rupture and stillbirths. And then finally it's found its place as just a postnatal agent. And the actual uh, active agent, ergometrin, was isolated by Chassa Moya in 1932. And it, around the world, it's really known variably as ergonavine and ergobacine. So it acts as lo lots of receptors. And really, we're not completely sure how it causes uterine contraction. It's possibly a calcium channel or an alpha receptor. And we're all very familiar with the side effects. Uh, nausea and vomiting, probably due to dopamine and 5-HT receptors. Hypertension, due to the alpha adrenoreceptor. And that makes it contraindicated in preeclampsia, but also in cardiovascular disease, as it increases the pulmonary artery pressures and can cause coronary and renal vascular spasm. It comes straight, as shown here, or as a combination with uh, oxytocin, which is known as sintometrin, which is commonly used in our label ward. And the, the recommended dose is variably 200 to 500 micrograms. So it was Henry Dale who documented the effects of the posterior pituitary on the uterus in 1909. And it had the same adverse effects as ergometrin, really, with lots of stillbirth and uterine rupture. But it wasn't until 1953 when Devigneau uh, synthesized the octopeptide that actually works as oxytocin. And so it acted a G-protein coupled receptor. And we see it used to augment labor as well as prevent and treat postpartum hemorrhage. So because it is a G-protein coupled receptor, it's susceptible to the uh, phenomenon of desensitization and downregulation. In other words, they're become, uh, with ongoing use, there are fewer receptors and they don't respond with the same effect. It's been demonstrated in rats and it really gives a good scientific basis to our clinical practice of moving on from oxytocin to another agent if there hasn't been a good response to oxytocin. So oxytocin dosing in caesarean delivery is an area that's really changed a lot in the last 10 years. Uh, Cavallo and others uh, used logistic regression to find out the ED90 during caesarean section, and it was found to be 0 0.35 units. Clinically, when they do dose-finding studies, really they find that most people get very good uterine tone. This is in elective cases with no oxytocin or very small boluses. And they concluded that doses of 0 0.5 to 3 units is adequate to achieve uterine tone in elective caesarean section. And because of the receptor effects, uh, the case in a failure to progress type of caesarean section is different. They've been exposed to oxytocin, the likely uh, receptor down regulation. The ED90 is higher and it has been found to be three units. And so why are we fussing? Well, it's important for us to get the lowest effective dose because of the adverse effects of oxytocin. And as we've all seen, uh, these are cardiovascular, including hypotension, tachycardia, ST depression, headache, flushing, nausea and vomiting. And these were much more marked when we were using 10 units. And they seem really uncommon now that we're using three. And it's also important to note that these effects are exaggerated if a patient is hypovolemic. And there's one report of a death after 10 units were given to an unresuscitated woman under neuraxial anesthesia. Now, in the United Kingdom, they do a lot of surveys of their practice. And they published a survey last year looking at what kind of oxytocin, oxytocin doses were being used and if they've changed since these dose-finding studies have been published. 
And they found that for the first time since doing this survey, no one was using 10 units. However, really most of them were still using five with only a really small number actually using less than five for an elective caesarean section. So ch change is slow. And I'm not sure uh, in Australia what a survey of anaesthetists would show us, but in 2010, uh, a survey on oxytocin use was done in obstetricians in Australia and New Zealand. And that showed that the majority still use 10 units, or I think they think they use 10 units. Um, and only a couple actually suggested that they might use two to three units. But the main interesting thing was only 2% said that it was the anaesthetist who decided what the dose was. I think the answers might have been different if they'd asked the anaesthetist. So maybe we should ask ourselves what we use. In our institution, which is a really nice place to work, really nice blue sky, nice place to live, possibly not as nice as the Gold Coast and how it's been treating us over the weekend. Uh, so I think at our place, the anaesthetists choose the dose. Um, we use three units for an elective caesarean section and three units for an emergency caesarean section, and we always offer more. And my personal opinion is that it reduces side effects a lot, and a kind of follow-on effect is that it improves your communication with the surgeon, because they're always wanting to find out how much have you given and are you going to give some more. And so at least it starts the conversation. And when we talk to registrars who rotate through our hospital, it, it becomes fairly obvious that this lower dose is often a new concept to them. So I think practice is probably changing slowly as in the, new, as in the UK. Now carbatocin is obviously the newest agent and it works on the same receptor as oxytocin in the same way but just has different pharmacokinetics. It achieves firm uterine tone after two minutes and the duration of action is an hour. It was initially examined in healthy women having elective caesarean section under regional anaesthesia. And these trials showed it was better than placebo and equivalent to oxytocin. And a Cochrane review in 2012 supports that um, uh, after caesarean section or vaginal delivery with less requirement for other agents. Now, comparisons are quite different, difficult because they're compared to oxytocin, and everyone really uses oxytocin in very different ways. Some give a bolus followed by a higher concentration infusion, some give a bolus followed by a lower concentration infusion, and some just use an infusion. So comparing studies is actually quite tricky. And there's a lot of international variation in the licensing. In Australia and Canada, it hasn't really moved on from the elective caesarean section under regional anaesthesia. In the European Union, it's licensed for both elective and emergency caesarean section. And in Mexico and Russia, it is licensed just for vaginal delivery. And it's not licensed for use anywhere after a general anaesthetic, and that's because of those initial studies that were done in regional anaesthesia. So onto the prostaglandins. It was in Stockholm that Bergstrom identified all the individual prostaglandins in the 1960s. And we relatively familiar with the prostaglandin E2s from handover, the prostin and cervidil, which are used for cervical maturation. Misoprostol is a prostaglandin E1 analog, and it has been evaluated for postpartum hemorrhage. And its main distinguishing feature is that you can deliver it by the oral or rectal route, and it has a good long storage life. Regarding F2 alpha, uh, the Japanese were the first ones to report injecting this straight into the uterus for postpartum hemorrhage. And they suggested that in 1976. Now the side effects of prostaglandin F2-alpha are well known. It can cause pulmonary hypertension, VQ mismatch with hypoxemia, bronchospasm, hypothermia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, hypotension, hypertension and cardiovascular collapse. And all of that can happen while you're having a massive hemorrhage. So various institutions have got strict guidelines on how to draw it up. Um, and what I would say, it's really very useful to have the, the, the guide to how to draw it up and what the recommended dose is, right with the ampule, right in theatre, because it's usually at a time when you can't be doing mental calculations while everything else is going on. The other thing to consider is uh, what type of needle you might require. 
because if the abdomen's closed, hasn't been open yet, you might have to use a spinal needle to go through the anterior abdominal wall. Whereas if it's open, just any needle is fine. So while we're primarily concerned with a caesarean section management or postpartum hemorrhage treatment, it's also interesting to see what the recent practice is with respect to vaginal delivery. And in the 1980s, it was suggested that active management of the third stage actually reduced the incidence of PPH by 70%. And that's accepted and supported by a Cochrane systematic review that, are, that are active management reduces the need for transfusion and the need for additional uterotonics. So what's active management? Well, traditionally it was known as uh, administration of an oxytocic agent, early cord clamping, which by de definition is less than a minute, and use of controlled cord traction for the removal of the placenta. So we'll have a look at these things. So early cord clamping has actually been removed from some protocols, and that's due to largely more fetal harm and no maternal benefit, because uh, it tends to make, to reduce fetal iron stores, and especially in preterms, there's an increased risk of intraventricular hemorrhage and transfusion rates. Controlled cord traction uh, was examined again in 2012 by the WHO, and they, they compared active management both with and without controlled cord traction, and really found that it didn't make much difference. And the RANSCOG document, our Australian um, Obstetric College, they do recommend active management. They recommend the use of a uterotonic, assisted placental removal, but it doesn't specify certainly any um, early cord clamping. So it seems that probably the oxytocic is the most important, combined with good clinical practice. And so if it's the most important one, which one should we be using out of, out of these three options? So for vaginal delivery, Sintometrin, that's the combination of the ox oxytocin with ergometrin, has shown a small benefit in terms of a risk reduction for a postpartum hemorrhage of 500 mils if it's compared with just straight oxytocin. But of course, whenever oxy, uh, ergometrin is examined, the, there's always the increased risk of hypertension, nausea and vomiting. So rectal misoprostol has been compared to injectable oxytocics and found to be less effective. And it's probably because of its parental route of administration and the late rise in the plasma level. Uh, but use of a sublingual route does achieve um, levels faster. And again, it's probably just a most of benefit in developing countries. And carbitocin currently is, uh, is not currently licensed in Australia. So now that we've had a look at the agents, let's have a look at Mrs. RS again. It's back to 1863. Shows she's an old grand multip. She has an overdistended uterus. She has had a long labor. And these days, We'd have had an ultrasound to have a look at those twins and which way up they are. She might have been recommended to have a caesarean section. For a vaginal delivery, she would have an IV in situ. She would have had a group and hold. She will have active management of the third stage, access to a safe blood transfusion and rapid access to surgery uh, and if required, maybe a hysterectomy. But you know what? She did okay with the management of the day. She had a hemorrhage in the third stage and nearly died. And I expect they saw that quite a bit. She had uterine compression, cold packs, breastfeeding, and she was discharged on day six. So in summary, the uterotonic agents are likely to have contributed somewhat to this rapid decline in maternal mortality that happened after 1937. Each of the agents have a role to play in the prevention and tre treatment of postpartum hemorrhage. And I think our practice of caesarean section and using oxytocin will continue to evolve over, over time and it would be quite useful to audit that. And the ideal agent will really depend on where you're working and the specific characteristics of the patient. Thank you. Um, thanks, Victoria. You're looking at a guy who uh, gave 10 units of um, oxytocin as fast as you could after delivery for 20 years. 
and um, I don't do it anymore. Uh, but it was a norm for a very long time. Um, something to think about. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, David Elliott from Westmead Hospital. And uh, we've heard him before. He's a very uh, good speaker. And uh, uh, he's going to talk about something that's never, ever happened to anybody in this room. The failed epidural. What next? But there are people who do have failed epidurals, so uh, I'm interested to know what they have to do. We, ne we never admit to them. Thanks, Sam. Um, I'll just plug this in. Uh, thanks very much, everyone, for um, for coming this morning. This uh, the and uh, I reiterate James's um, comment before. Uh, thank you for coming to the um, session on the final day. And it reminds me of I know it's an old it's an old story, and you've probably all heard it many times before. But the story about the speaker who comes along to the the, the final session on the final day of the conference, and um, he stands up and he looks out into this sea of empty seats, and then. He just spots one person halfway back on the left and he says, oh, thank you so much for coming to my, you know, my talk. I've spent such a long time preparing for it. You know, I really appreciate the fact that you're the one person who's come to, to hear me. And he looks up from the audience and he says, uh, actually, I'm the speaker after you. <laughs> old, old story. Anyway, um, the failed epidural, what next? Uh, first of all, a very brief run through um, the uh, history of, um, of uh, analgesia in labour. Have to uh, actually before I start, um, you meant to do disclosures. I've uh, received dinner from Smith's Medical, um, uh, which makes the uh, one of the epidural pumps. Um, but a quick quick run through of the history of epidural analgesia in labour. As I say, didn't didn't start off um, terribly well. You'd have to say women were not really. Um, you know, didn't have a great deal uh, out of this in the, in the early days. If you look back um, to one of the stories from the Bible, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. It was meant to be some sort of divine retribution uh, on women because Eve led Adam astray in the Garden of Eden. And things actually didn't get a whole lot better for many, many centuries. If you were a midwife in the Middle Ages and you administered analgesia to a woman in labour, uh, you were likely to be considered a witch and burnt at the stake. So um, that, wasn't a, that wasn't a great profession in those days. And things didn't change a lot um, until the 19th century, and I'm sure you're all very familiar with this uh, picture, a photo, which is a picture of um, William Morton administering ether to Edward Gilbert Abbott, a young man who was having a, a neck tumour um, removed at the Ether Dome in Massachusetts General Hospital on October the 16th, 1846, which was the first successful demonstration of, of general anaesthesia. And news spread pretty quickly, um, very soon, uh, and, and the surgeon involved was John, um, John Warren, and uh, he is said to have turned to the audience in the ether dome and said, gentlemen, this is no humbug. Uh, and then and our, our specialty took off after, well, it didn't really take off, it, it, it started after that. Very quickly, um, uh, James Young Simpson, uh, who is uh, the professor of midwifery and obstetrics in Edinburgh, was this paper actually describes him using ether, although he used chloroform much more for analgesia and labour, uh, and that he started using it um, uh, on, on women in labour. He also apparently had great chloroform parties at home. He was the he um, he used it recreationally um, and uh, with himself and and friends who he invited round for dinner and ether. Um, back across the Atlantic, back in the US, uh, Fanny Appleton, who in 1847, she was the wife of a famous American poet, Henry Longfellow, and um, she was the first woman in the US to receive ether for obstetric analgesia. But, anal but, but these agents remained a little bit on the fringe um, for pain relief for, for a while. And what really changed, in the English-speaking world at least, was when John Snow, in 1853, administered chloroform to Queen Victoria for the birth of her second to last child, Prince Leopold, and, um, and she's reported to have referred to it as that blessed chloroform, and things really, um, uh, it, it gained a sort of a, an acceptance as a result of that. Not great times in the early part of the 20th century when, this, when something called uh, twilight sleep came along, which, um, which essentially involved giving women uh, huge doses of morphine and scopolamine, which effectively rendered them insensible, 
to, uh, to their, um, uh, their labour. So I guess it, it worked in terms of providing analgesia. Unfortunately, it killed quite a lot of women because of uh, respiratory depression and, and aspiration. And so that fortunately disappeared pretty quickly. In the, in the next uh, decade or so, in the 1910s and 1920s, something that we would start to recognise as, as uh, providing uh, epidural analgesia um, uh, started to be used, and that was the use of cordals, usually single shot, occasionally uh, with, uh, with uh, malleable catheters left in the, in the cordal space to provide analgesia. And then finally, in the 1950s, um, we see something that really we... Uh, we recognise as being an epidural. Initially, single shot epidurals, usually administered by obstetricians, uh, and then when, with the advent of epidural catheters, epidurals administered by anaesthetists. And really, you know, what, what, what's happened since then has been fine tuning, uh, you could say, rather than uh, rather of, the, of the drugs that we use and, and some of the bits of kit that we've got available to us. Anyway, getting back to what I wanted to talk about today, which is rescuing the failed epidural, uh, and I'll talk about it in the obstetric context. And this scenario won't, uh, there's nothing particularly strange about this. Um, you're, on, you're on call for the delivery suite or birth unit. You get a call at two o'clock, a request for analgesia in, a, in an uncomplicated primer at term. Uh, she's in early, early, early but active labour at three centimetres. Cephalic presentation, occipito posterior, nothing strange there. So you go in and you insert an uncomplicated epidural, lumbar epidural, um, give an initial dose with a reasonably standard mix, a total of 15 mils of 8% bupivacaine plus fentanyl. And after 15 minutes of uh, adequate analgesia, OBS are stable. You're, you're, you're terribly, terribly modern and so you set up a um, uh, intermittent mandatory bolus epidural regime uh, with some midwife administered top-ups for breakthroughs. And you go back to bed thinking that that's, uh, that's all uh, very, very well and good. At 3.30, you're asleep. And the phone rings. And at 3.40, the phone rings again. And then you wake up. And the midwife says, the epidural block isn't working. And, uh, and uh, you try and sort of, you know, obfuscate and say, well, what about giving a top-up? Oh, I've tried that. It's not working. It's not working. So you, you come back into the hospital um, and uh, on your way in, you're thinking about the various different things that could be happening and why your epidural that seemed to go in so well um, suddenly doesn't seem to be working. And what you're hoping, of course, and what you uh, expected was that your, your epidural catheter was in the midline or somewhere thereabouts, and it works as intended and provides good analgesia. And that's what occurs most of the time. In fact, statistically, that's what occurs around about 85% of the time. But we're here to talk about what happens in the remaining 15%. Um, the epidural catheter, of course, could, be, could have been misplaced in an in a innocuous but completely ineffective and non-epidural location. And usually that's uh, where the catheter has, where your um, epi or TUI needle has encountered some sort of degenerative cyst or, or has some sort of false loss of resistance in the paraspinal muscles and ends up just, just curled up in a, as I say, an innocuous subcutaneous or intramuscular space but won't actually provide much analgesia. Although, of course, the bracket, the, the subtext of that is you can be tricked because remember that we've given 15 or 20 mils of our local anaesthetic mix containing fentanyl, uh, and so you may get some analgesia just from the, the subcutaneous or intramuscular uh, fentanyl component. And so, so you may get some analgesia even though it's not in the epidural space, but it's certainly not from a local anaesthetic effect on epidural nerve roots. Or it could be in the epidural space, but only partially effective. And there's uh, lots of reasons for this. The catheter could have um, gone out uh, laterally and be in a lateral compartment. Um, it could be in the, uh, it could be in the subdural space and uh, you can get very bizarre patchy sort of blocks. Um, Clive Collier, who many of you would know very well, is a very well-known Sydney anaesthetist and he's um, published uh, this fantastic uh, book called An Atlas of Epidurograms. So over the years, 
Um, Clive has had to, every, every time he's uh, encountered a, uh, some sort of unusual block, uh, somehow he's managed to get consent from these women and has done epidurograms um, on them. I think the book could be better retitled Putting Epidural Catheters in Places You Didn't Even Know Existed, but there's certainly some very interesting in, uh, pictures. There's, it's not a great uh, rendition of it, but that's the, that's the so-called tram tracking uh, of, the, um, of the radio contrast media that you get with a, with a subdural catheter. Or there could be obstruction to the free flow of a local anaesthetic solution from a dorsal or midline septum if you, if you believe they exist. Um, or if you're using uh, um, uh, air for loss of resistance, which I don't think many people would use these days, but, but some may, you can get an air pocket uh, around a nerve root and have inadequate analgesia from that. And then finally, of course, the catheter could be in a wrong and potentially dangerous place such as intravascular with the risk of systemic toxicity or intrathecal with the risk of a rapidly ascending total spinal block. So when you examine the woman, she definitely has, with, with, with ice uh, and, and talking to her, she definitely has analgesia, but it seems to be all on the, on the left-hand side, really, and it's very patchy on the right-hand side. So it's... it's she has a block, but it's definitely ineffective on the right-hand side. So you quickly run through your choices again. So what's well, not working as intended, and you can't see where it is, but you think, hmm, it doesn't seem to be you know, in the midline and working well. She's got, she appears to have a local anaesthetic effect within, within at least the, within the um, uh, intra, uh, within the vertebral column. Uh, you don't think it's, well I'll come back to whether it could be spinal in a minute, but you, you certainly don't think it's in one of these innocuous places where you might get analgesia, but you won't get a sensory uh, block in a dermatomal distribution, so you don't think it's that. You don't think it's in a wrong and potentially dangerous place because it was intravascular, um, although uh, she probably wouldn't have got systemic to toxicity at the sort of dose you're using, she also wouldn't have got analgesia, and you don't think it's intrathecal because she'd actually have fantastic analgesia if that was the case uh, and possibly too high a block. So you're pretty sure that it's in the epidural space but it's only partly effective with, mis with missed segments on the right hand side. And then you have to decide uh, what are you going to do about that. And your options are, it's not rocket science as you know, it's, you can take it out and start again which is what, uh, which is what I would strongly advise you do if, you, if, if there is no analgesic block at all, because it probably means it's not in the epidural space. Um, you can manipulate the catheter and give a top up, and that's often what's been traditionally taught in these situations, that if you have a patchy block on one side, the assumption is, is that your catheter has somehow gone in and, and gone off to one side, and if there's a bit of, uh, if there's a bit of a margin to pull it back, you can, uh, as a sterile technique, pull back the catheter uh, lie, the, lie the woman on the side that's not working so well and give a top-up. Or you can give the top-up without catheter manipulation. And there's not a lot of data available, um, but there is a really nice paper, which is quite old now, it's from 1998, and it looks at, at the option of uh, treatment of incomplete analgesia um, after an epidural catheter with local anaesthetic, with a top-up dose of local anaesthetic, with using manipulation of the catheter or not using manipulation of the catheter. And what this group did was they had a it's re reasonably old-fashioned looking epidural to us now. They put a lumbar epidural catheter in with loss of resistance to air, used quarter percent uh, bupivacaine, so a reasonably high concentration of local anaesthetic by today's standards, with a total of um, 13 mils. And then uh, the, the women were assessed at 15 minutes, and those, those women, if they had inadequate analgesia, um, they were randomised to two groups. The first group was given local anaesthetic, another five mils of the quarter percent bupivacaine, and in, catheter, in, in group two, the catheter was pulled back a centimetre. They were given five mils of the quarter percent marcaine, uh, and then they were reassessed after another 15 minutes, and if there was still inadequate analgesia, that process was repeated. And uh, they, had, they had good numbers. They had a total of 639 women. I think they ended up, from memory, with 78 in total. Let's have a look. Uh, I think there were 70, 39, 39 plus 39. What's that? 40. 78 in total. Um, and they had an incidence of incomplete analgesia of 12%, which is in keeping uh, with, with, um, with the rest of the literature. And interestingly, 
Uh, over three quarters of these women, 81% had incomplete analgesia on the right hand side. And, that, and, and that's very common to get this so-called L1 sparing. And there's lots of theoretical reasons why that may be the case, which I won't go into now, but we could talk about later if we want. But certainly the majority of incomplete analgesia with epidural catheters is on the right hand side. So this was a success after the initial intervention with the, um, with the five mils of extra local anaesthetic. And you can see between the two groups, there was no difference. Both, both uh, that was effective in, in, uh, in around about three quarters, 74% and 77% respectively, irrespective of whether you manipulated the catheter or not. And then those women who went on to have a second intervention, uh, all of the women in both groups had complete analgesia with those top-up doses. So my suggestion from this is that, in fact, even if you have a patchy block, unless it is a, a true unilateral block, there's actually no point in manipulating the catheter. You can just give a top-up. This particular group used three-quarter percent, uh, quarter percent bupivacaine. Um, these days, I, I would, although we don't have any evidence from the literature for this, um, I would suggest using our low-dose mixture uh, to, to give that extra top-up. And then you can reassess things. And if you've still got inadequate analgesia, that's the point where you say, this is not working. I'm going to bail out and talk to the woman and, depending on the clinical circumstances, offer to recite that uh, epidural, either as an epidural or my own preference would be for a combined spinal epidural. So that's, um, that's uh, an approach for management of the failed epidural in, uh, in birth unit what, or delivery suite. What about when you're first putting in a catheter and you want to, you want to, give this, you want to test the catheter? And uh, traditionally there was this idea of giving a test dose with a high concentration of um, a small volume of high concentration local anaesthetic such as 2% lignocaine. The problem is, is that every single dose of local anaesthetic you give down an epidural catheter should be a test dose. Just because your test dose indicates that you are not in the wrong place, and I'll come back to that double negative in a minute, uh, does not mean that subsequent doses uh, are necessarily safe. So I don't really like the idea of a, a one-stop test dose that thereafter means that your catheter is safe, because that's not the case. And the reason why, why we should consider every dose we give as uh, local anaesthetic being a test dose is that we know that the incidence of dural puncture is between about half percent and, and two percent, depending on the circumstance, dispend, depending on the, um, on the uh, experience of, uh, of the anaesthetist involved, and that venous placement in the pregnant population can be anything up to, a bloody tap can be anything up to 15% of blocks, much more than in the non-obstetric population because of venous engorgement of the epidural vessels. So I talked about this before, a test dose of your epidural catheter tests that the catheter is not in the wrong place, but it will not test if it is actually correctly sited. So it hopefully will tell you whether it's intravascular or intrafecal, although nothing in life is 100%, but it will not tell you that it is definitely in the epidural space. But the idea of a test dose is to test for safety, not to test for efficacy. It also won't identify subdural placement, and it won't guarantee subsequent bizarre catheter behaviour that sometimes is very, very hard to explain. So what are the tests we've got to detect catheter misplacement? Well, there's physical tests. You can uh, passively lower the catheter tip without a filter on it uh, to avoid a, a, an air fluid um, air lock interface. And uh, blood you can see uh, flowing back passively sometimes. And CSF can be identified, differentiated from saline using a dextra sticks. This business about, people talk about feeling the temperature on the back of your hand. I've never, I don't quite understand that. Never, never, uh, doesn't seem to... Um, Makes sense to me. Or you can actively aspirate on your, on your catheter uh, without a filter attached as well, looking for um, either blood or continuous um, aspiration of clear fluid, which you may suspect is CSF. Or you can use an active test dose of local anaesthetic to detect subarachnoid placement, plus or minus adrenaline to detect intravenous placement of your catheter. And the general principle of a, of a test dose is that you should always be using a massive drug that is less than that required to produce a dangerously high spinal. And you can see that you don't actually need to use anything other 
than your low dose mix. You don't have to use a high concentration low flow anaesthetic such as 2% lignocaine. It's, it, it's the number of milligrams of local that you're putting in uh, that, that is significant. And it doesn't matter whether you're using bupivacaine, lignocaine, which I wouldn't advise because you're not, it's not a, you're not going to be subsequently using lignocaine for your block or opivacaine. It really doesn't matter. And there are both signs and symptoms, and what you're looking for here uh, for intra detection of intrathecal placement uh, is, uh, is either one, of the, one or other of these signs or symptoms. The signs being an objective sensory block uh, to ice, motor weakness or hypotension, none of which you would expect to get if you're administering, administering those sort of doses into the epidural space, but which you would get if it was intrathecal, and likewise the symptoms of, um, of warmth Re instant relief of labour pain makes you look really good but it makes me really anxious uh, because you know that it's probably not epidural, it's much more likely to be intrathecal or, or numbness. Doesn't mean that you, it doesn't mean you can't use that catheter uh, for analgesia and labour and for instrumental or, or operative delivery if you need it, but you have to use it as an intrathecal catheter and it has to be you or another anaesthetist who you hand over to directly who uses that catheter. You can't delegate that to a non-anaesthetist to use an intrathecal catheter. Likewise, we can add um, adrenaline to try and uh, detect intravascular placement if we've got a bloody tap and we've flushed our catheter and it's, uh, it's coming back a bit pink and we're not quite sure whether it's intravascular or, or just a bit of contamination with blood. 15 micrograms of adrenaline in a, in a non-labouring patient is, uh, is highly sensitive and specific. The problem with labour, of course, is that the heart rate is going up and down anyway, so you have to try and catch uh, the time when uh, in between contractions, so it's less, um, it, it's less reliable during labour. One thing that is, um, that is very sensitive, but possibly not specific, is a small injection of epidural air down the epidural catheter, which you can do and just hold a, uh, a handheld Doppler or an ultrasound probe over the precordium, and it's incredibly sensitive. You just get this, even, even I, as, a, as, a, as not a great ultras, ultrasound anaesthetist, can see this instant snowstorm of bubbles coming through um, the right ventricle. Um, if, it's, if it's intravascular. Interestingly, you'll get exactly the same thing as if you just shake a syringe of saline and you remove every evidence of macroscopic air from that and you inject that intravenously, you'll actually get the same effect. It's amazing the amount of air <laughs> that we are injecting into patients all the time without realising it. So let's go back to uh, the operating theatre uh, now. So, of course, this woman who you've managed to get reasonable analgesia on, uh, uh, but she's, she's developed a non-reassuring CTG and failure to progress and the obstetrician wants to take her to theatre for an, an urgent but not, not code critical caesarean section. You, you're happy enough with the epidural uh, and um, arguably that's not good enough but you're happy enough with the epidural and you top her up with 2% lignocaine and adrenaline. She's very difficult to assess. She's extremely distressed, not so much because of pain but because she's really anxious about what's going on. But she, she appears to have a block bilaterally to T6 with ice or says that she does when you ask her and the obstetrician starts. And you know that this isn't going to end, end nicely and sure enough, she experiences unbearable pain at the time of incision on the, um, on the peritoneum. Um, so what are you going to do at, at this point? And at, at this point, we're dealing with the, the failed epidural. Ideally, this would have been identified prior to the skin incision, but we all know that that doesn't, doesn't always happen. If you do have, if you can identify um, uh, that you have an, an epidural that is inadequate, and I would argue that that, that um, not, if you're not quite certain that she's got that block to T6, which I don't think is high enough, it should be at T4, I would have said this is a failed epidural prior to starting the skin incision, but we all um, get caught out from time to time. But assuming we've identified it, there are a couple of options. I really don't think saying to the surgeon and the woman, we'll just abandon this and we'll repeat the epidural in three to four hours once, we've, once we're within our safe, safe time zone to give more local anaesthetic is an option because we're already at our systemic, uh, close to our systemic uh, maximum dose of local is an option. Spinal on its own is a bit tricky uh, if you've already got a partial epidural block to know how much to give. 
CSC I put in bold there because that would be my preferred, uh, preferred option here. I'd take the epidural catheter out, do a low dose CSC and insert the epidural and extend that block as necessary. Or uh, a gen remember a general anaesthetic is always an option. If the surgery is already begun, it depends a bit on, on what stage the surgeon's up to. There's a difference between pain on skin incision versus pain right at the very end when the surgeon, the obstetrician's sewing, sewing up. So it's very different, very, um, uh, very um, uh, different circumstances. Again, the option to, to wait uh, with, an, with an open abdomen uh, and top up the epidural plus giving some epidural fentanyl, I really don't think is a great, uh, you know, it's not, it's not really possible in that, in that situation. It would take a lot of nerve to say, we have to wait another, you know, another half an hour for this to work. It may be that, that you could say, can we, can we check the fetal heart rate and wait another five or 10 minutes? That's a possibility. I've written one supplemental agent. I've seen lots of anaesthetic charts where, where it says something like, um, uh, maternal distress, uh, offered GA, would prefer to stay awake, uh, given supplement. And then you actually read through the supplements and it's got fentanyl, 50 micrograms, ketamine, 20 milligrams, mm, midazolam, 2 milligrams, propofol, 20 plus 20 plus 20. Well, it's starting to look awfully like a gen an uncontrolled uh, general anaesthetic to me, and I really don't think that that, uh, that is, a, is a way to go. One supplemental agent, though, I think is reasonable. Conversion to a general anaesthetic uh, it should, always be, should always be an option uh, and has to be, in this situation, has to be offered to this woman. And if towards the end of the surgery, if there's some um, in, uh, pain on, on uh, during, the, during sewing up, then local anaesthetic infiltration by the surgeon uh, is quite reasonable as well. What we really want to avoid is this kind of thing. I didn't realise until recently that we, apparently we don't have enough rubbish tabloids in Australia of our own. We can actually download the Daily Mail um, from England over here. And this is uh, an article from 2010 uh, of a, a woman who, um, who had a supposedly a botched epidural. And, uh, and, it, and these botched epidurals that we're doing all the time apparently are making women terrified of birth. And not only that, they are, they are causing the soaring caesarean section rate. So uh, in the article, I've just taken a few bits out of it, but when Sarah's anaesthetist arrived, it took him at least four attempts to get the needle in the right place. Even then, the epidural didn't work. Leaving Sarah, now 37, I think the implication there is she's actually had a birthday during the process of, of these four attempts. I think this is to emphasise how long it was taking. From Surrey, was still able to feel the contractions. Um, and... Uh, and then, uh, and, and then uh, she had to go to uh, theatre for a caesarean section. In theatre, doctors tried three times to top up the epidural, but when the surgeon made the first incision in her abdomen, Sarah was still able to feel it and was in terrible pain. Um, she had to undergo a general anaesthetic and was therefore unconscious when her daughter, Molly, was born. And unfortunately, th this is, th this is uh, it, does, it does happen, and I think... It, it, will, it does happen to all of us, it will happen, um, and, but we have to be uh, prepared to acknowledge when we're having difficulty that this, isn't, this is not working and just, can, uh, just persisting over and over again uh, is, not the way to, is not the way to go. Now, um, we can, I was going to talk a little bit about uh, alternatives, um, partic in particular remifentanil in obstetrics, but I think I might leave it and... Uh, five, minutes. five minutes. Yeah, I, th I think... Uh, I'd like to know. You'd like to know. All right, well, I'll, I'll try and zip through the... The trouble is, well, you know what I'm conscious of? David Bogod, and, uh, and they've, really, they've really messed with my brain, David Bogod and Will Harrop Griffiths on that first day, because what they said is, you must never skip through slides uh, and say, I haven't got time for these. I'm about to skip through some slides. All right. Remy fentanyl in obstetrics, because really this is this is an, uh, an interesting and and um, uh, potential uh, be next best option to epidurals uh, in the situation of a, of a failed epidural block as an alternative. As you know, it's a uh, remy fentanyl is a extremely um, short acting opioid. It's the it's got a labile, very labile ester linkage, which is hydrolyzed extremely quickly. Uh, to ni greater than 95% of it is metabolised uh, very quickly to completely inactive 
a completely inactive metabolite. It's got a very rapid onset of action, it's got a very uh, predictable, context-sensitive half-time of three minutes, um, which does not change. So remifentanil does not accumulate with infusion um, or repeated PCA boluses, no matter how long you give it, unlike other opioids. Um, and it has potential uses in, in uh, obstetric anaesthesia, especially analgesia and labour, which is what I want to talk about now. And it can be given uh, intravenously, as you know. And the idea was that the timing in pharmacokinetics, is in, because it's analogous to nitrous oxide, the idea is, is that you could, you could um, uh, teach women to press their PCA button very early at the start of a contraction, and then as the, as the pain of the contraction rose, uh, you get the peak pharmacological effect of the remifentanil at the same time, and that was wonderful, and it, everything would be rosy, and then by the end of the contraction, there'd be no remifentanil uh, left because it would have been metabolised. It doesn't work quite like that, unfortunately. Um, we do know that it has no adverse neonatal effects on the basis of APGARs uh, and has very similar kinetics in neonates as does in adults, even, even premature neonates. And it was first look, it first started to appear on the radar in obstetrics in the, in the 1990s. Uh, there were lots of just one-off case reports, remifentanil, in, in, usually in women who were contraindicated to have an epidural with thrombocytopenia, uh, some very early case series. Um, uh, Mark Lovell and I actually put one into the International Journal of Obstetric Anesthesia on a woman with, um, with spina bifida, interestingly. Um, again, platelet abnormalities, then small series started to come out with varying reports of efficacy and, and complications. Um, I'm doing the wrong thing here, I'm skipping through, because what I really want to do is to, is to show that the problem is, is there really is a, is a there's, there's still a lack of prospective work. Mark Vandervald, who's, who's um, a very well-known obstetric anaesthetist from uh, uh, Belgium, he talked at, a, uh, at an IJOA uh, debate um, in 2008 and, and indicated that there were, there were very few prospective studies at the time. There were only 308 parturients. It hasn't gone up a lot since then. There were small sample sizes, significant sedation, and problems of pruritus and nausea. He wasn't so keen on it. On the other hand, David Hill from Ireland, where their unit has used remifentanil routinely in labour for well over a decade now, um, uh, really uh, ha has used it very effectively and did describe how it was providing incomplete but useful uh, analgesia with apparently no effect on, on neonates. There are lots of questions that come up about remifentanil. Will it affect my baby? Well, we know that remifentanil is, uh, remifentanil crosses the placenta very rapidly. If you look at the umbilical vein to paternal artery, ratio, you can see that a lot of remifentanil crosses, however if you look at the umbilical artery to umbilical vein ratio, you can see that it's very quickly metabolised by the neonate as well. So it crosses but the, uh, the neonate handles it very well. Um, we, know, we definitely know it's better for the baby than, the pethid for, for, than pethidine um, and uh, what would be interesting is a head-to-head -head study versus fentanyl, which we started at Westmead a number of years ago and unfortunately had to abandon uh, because we were, the protocol, uh, we ended up using very high doses of fentanyl because we were using a microgram per kilogram baby, uh, basis and we did have one neonate who was ventilated overnight in, in NICU after the mother was using a fentanyl PCA, so we need to change that protocol and look at it again. Will it affect the mother? And this is what's, this is what's I think, has unfortunately changed the, changed the landscape a little bit and, and made it probably less, less useful. Uh, we know that women who are in normal labour uh, are sedated a significant amount of the time. So when you use remifentanil PCA, about 10% of the time the saturation is less than 95% this is with room air, and 5% less than 90%. Interestingly, that is very similar to women who do not have any opiates on board whatsoever. So it's very common for women in labour, 
even without any analgesia on board, to become hypoxic, hypoxemic. The issue is uh, that there have been a series of case reports, and there were four reported in one year, respiratory and or, near, and or cardiac arrest, uh, three of which were in anaesthesia. And um, it was noted by, uh, I think it's Mike Kinsella and another author who I don't know, that the problem is that the safety outcomes in the real world use of remifentanil might be worse than in tightly controlled uh, studies. And they suggested that without due respect for the side effects of remifentanil, um, uh, we risk side, side effects of remifentanil, we risk sleepwalking into a maternal death related to its use in the near future. So um, the, the answer for remifentanil is that if you're, in a, if you're in an institution that is using it all the time, has really tight protocols, and your midwives are used to using it, then I think it's fine. But for the occasional use, I just don't think remifentanil uh, is, a, is, a, is a actually a useful or a safe alternative, which is not what I would have said if I'd stood up here a year or two ago. But uh, I think that there's enough... Uh, reports coming out now of near misses um, to, uh, to make us think again. On that note, I will finish up. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll invite our uh, police to come down here and uh, I'll invite questions for about 10 minutes um, to see what we get. I have something to start off with, and I'll ask James. I um, uh, was interested that uh, he mentioned Friedrich's ataxia, um, and uh, interested because I had a family member, have a family member who was diagnosed with Friedrich's ataxia, uh, and she came along 30, 40 years ago and said to me, "Can I have an epidural?" And I said, "Yeah, sure, no problem." And uh, is there a lot of evidence for that? being just a little bit cavalier? No, I think that's uh, an epidural in many neurological diseases is a very good idea. A, a titrated epidural is safer than general anaesthesia and, in fact, safer than single-shot spinal anaesthesia. There's plenty of cases of single-shot spinal anaesthesia re leading to respiratory failure in patients with uh, clinical or even subclinical respiratory weakness. So a titrated epidural is the sort of ideal. Uh, and in fact, as you know, Friedrich's ataxia ladies can have a uh, cardiomyopathy as well. And um, a lady who came to uh, the Mater and uh, just to have a caesarean section, she had a, a big stack of literature to tell me that uh, I could go ahead and do a spinal and an epidural on her if I wanted to. She was very, very keen. Ah, any more any questions? In terms of a relapse, uh, I think that's quite uncommon. I think the, pre the presentation of neurological symptoms in the first day or two is much more likely to be obstetric related or, you know, conceivably epidural, uh, regional anaesthetic related. The uh, relapses, sort of the studies would suggest, occur over the few months postpartum, not in the sort of first day or two. Um, obviously studies looking at neurological symptoms, a sort of new onset of neurological symptoms in the first day or two after uh, regional anaesthesia and Felicity Reynolds has published in big papers, there are a number of big papers suggesting that about 95% uh, of those or 99% even are obstetric related rather than epidural related. But I think in a patient with MS it would be very unlikely to be MS in that sort of initial stage. Anything else? Am I allowed to ask a question? Yes. I've got can. a question for James. Um, with the patients who have got, uh, women who have got extensive um, uh, spinal instrumentation, so with Harrington rods, is, is a reasonable approach to do a deliberate, um, deliberate uh, uh, dural tap with an epidural needle and insert a, a spinal catheter for these women because of, the, because of the disruption of the epidural space and the potential for, for Zara and patchy blocks? But 
it's certainly described. It's not something I've done. What my preference is to use ultrasound and try and find a space that is beyond the level of the surgery, depending on uh, sometimes the level of the instrumentation and the level of the scarring on the skin are different. And they'll be, they usually come with a bag of x-rays so you can see what the uh, metal work looks like. But if you use ultrasound, you can very clearly image uh, normal looking spaces versus the, the metal works very easy to see. So um, I did it either to a spinal or try an epidural and see how, mm. see how it goes. So certainly continuous spinal anesthesia is described. Yeah. The, as I said in the talk, the uh, rates of um, postural puncture headaches seem to be lower related to scar scarring in the epidural space and reduction of fluid leak? The only time I've deliberately um, entered the subarachnoid space with an epidural needle is in a patient with uh, osteogenesis imperfecta. Um, and I made a decision to enter the uh, subarachnoid space. Um, I'm not sure that was the right thing to do at the time, but it worked well. Uh, and I thought if she got an epidural tap headache, we would deal with it in other ways than a blood pad. And did she? No, she didn't. She was recumbent anyway, just about, so mm. I think that was part of the, uh, of the art. Is anything else here? Mm. The question was the use of ultrasound. Uh, in the first instance for identifying um, uh, for, for real-time real ultrasound, I think that was the question. The, the, it's just technically incredibly difficult. There are quite nice probes now, particularly um, it's the curvy, the particular curvy linear probe. You can get good indicate, quite good indication of, of spaces. L uh, depends on how, how skilled you are, I guess, but it's harder to see the, the, um, the depth of the epidural space. I think it's much more useful for marking in the first instance than for doing it in real time. The whole, just the whole sterile technique, I, just, I haven't tried it, I just can't get my head around how I would even go about doing it safely, but James is probably a lot more skilled than I am in that. Yeah, and I've, I've tried it. I've certainly, if I get asked to assist with an epidural or a spinal at Caesar and the, you know, the registrar's had three goes and the, 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 they're prepped and draped already, I'll put a sterile probe on the ultrasound and have a look and mark out just using a blunt needle, you can indent the skin. But again, my technique is basically marking the skin. The trouble is trying, it's a very tight space, so trying to hold the probe and get the needle in the right, so essentially they're both trying to occupy the same space at the same time. I think as the technology gets better, there are now, there's a device I saw recently with a magnetized needle. I'm not sure if they're here today in the trade display, but you, the magnetized needle comes up as a sort of virtual image on the ultrasound image, so you can see when it's going to enter your image, you can use an outer plane approach but still see the needle, which I think could, con it's still not going to solve the two-handed problem. There was a loss of resistance syringe with spring <coughs> called the epidural syringe a few years ago, which has gone out of production, but that was a, a one-handed epidural technique, so that would have allowed, uh, and there are reports of simultaneous uh, epidurals under vision using that one-handed technique. I shot myself with, a, with the Epishore syringe. I wouldn't advise you. <laughs> good, good fun, but uh, I think I got skewered in my right eye by a Tui needle at one stage. I might try to use one. I think uh, both of the drugs act at the same receptor, so I think following uh, what would be a, a large dose of oxytocin with a dose of carbitocin uh, is in a situation where the uterus isn't contracting, um, it wouldn't make a lot of pharmacological sense, and I think most um, uh, the most sensible thing to do would be to move on to another agent uh, not acting at the oxytocin receptor and manage the interpersonal <laughs> side of things <laughs> later. I'll go out on a limb here and I'll say we are the ones responsible for giving the oxytocin and we should decide on the dose. Uh, yes, I, I agree <laughs> with that. And, uh, it's our drug, not theirs, <laughs> at that point in time. Yeah. I was, uh, just, uh, you know, obstetricians, 
I, I'm sure they don't even know. I, what do you do most of the time? I tend to lie, to be honest. <laughs> I, I, it feels better for both of us if I do that. Right. I think uh, we'll have to call it a day. We've uh, reached the time. I've just got to see if I've got any uh, things to tell you. Uh, morning tea will be served in the exhibition halls one and two from 10.30 to 11. Um, and remember there are sessions to follow that. Um, that's about all. And there's some leftover satchels. So if you'd like another satchel, there's some apparently leftover. And uh, it just remains for me to thank the uh, speakers. I was entertained and informed by them. Uh, thank you very much.